There is a loss of jobs in South Africa. In fact, from uh, low shading to job shading. I must call a pastor to take you out now. Greetings, the people of South Africa, Africa, and the diaspora, and thanks very much for tuning in to yet another episode of the EFF podcast. My name is Titus Tsungu, and uh, today I'm joined by uh, one of the sharpest minds in the EFF, uh, Commissar Sinao Tambo is the EFF member of parliament. Commissar Sinao, Mshakas, Sakamkel, Lapekai. We do my Mandela House. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me. Mm-hmm. I don't know about being the sharpest man. <laughs> <laughs> One of thank those. You <laughs> having, uh, thank you for having us. Yeah. Uh, I want us to look at your political uh, career, although some say politics uh, or politics is not uh, a career. But let's look at your political journey. Uh, what shaped your political uh, consciousness? Uh, were you born a politician? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not necessarily. So I grew up in the Eastern Cape uh, mm-hmm. in what is now called Kaber. Oh, Kaber. Yeah, 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 yeah. So my father is uh, heavily, heavily ANC till this day. So, is it? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> How uh, did he let you though? <laughs> he's always been a, so I've always grown up cool. in a political type of environment. Mm-hmm. But uh, when I went to university, I was not attracted by the African National Congress, uh, what it stood for. And I had already been doing my own independent sort of understanding and assessment of what is wrong in South Africa mm-hmm. and what needs to be done to fix it. Mm-hmm. So, uh, of course, I studied at the University of Cape Town. And I think that's where really my political journey began. Because when I arrived at university, those moments of uh, roads must fall and fees mm-hmm. must fall were beginning. So I arrived... Uh, okay at UCT without accommodation. So I'd always be sleeping either in the labs or the library. Mm-hmm. The common challenges that students go through. And uh, so I was sort of radicalized by that experience and of course that political experience at home. Mm-hmm. And uh, from there, we got recruited into the EFF mm-hmm. and we formed the first branch at the University of Cape Town oh, okay. of the Students' Command. Yeah. So my journey really begins uh, in the student movement and mm-hmm. entering into the EFF. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And how has been the, the experience? Uh, when you talk about the issues of uh, higher education, we talk about uh, fees must fall, but to this day, we haven't really seen uh, a transformation in that sector or a revolution in that sector to a point where we have students who are, uh, are, are you know, are not struggling with uh, fees mm-hmm. or student accommodation and all of that. Are you happy at all with the status quo in as far as the institution of higher learning is concerned? No, absolutely not. Not much has changed. Eh? Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, the student command does a lot of great work since uh, it has been incepted of registering people for free at the beginning of the year, waging mm-hmm. those struggles. But the mere fact that we have to continuously have these protests in the beginning of the academic year shows you that there's mm-hmm. an underlying problem. Yeah. That hasn't changed, and that relates to, the, of course, the fact that education is not free. Yeah. Access to education is still a reserve for those who have money, those who are rich, those who have the necessary connections. Mm-hmm. Accommodation challenges, the dehumanizing way in which students are made to, like what I was exper- I experienced, there are still kids who sleep in labs, libraries, and toilets. They don't get their NASFAS allowances. That system is corrupted as well. There's a lot of corruption, and there's a lot of degeneration in the sector. So not much has changed. There's not much to write home about. Mm-hmm. But uh, as a generation, we made our contribution and hopefully those who come after us will continue that fight. Yeah. And you said your your father is ANC and you are EFF. Yeah. How do you <laughs> sit together <laughs> in a dinner table and discuss issues it's, of ideology uh, and all of that? It's quite interesting. Uh, yeah. Family gatherings are always quite heated, especially, <laughs> yeah. especially those that have... Uh, that happened in December, Amy Klimby and those sorts of things, because, of course, we have our opposing views. But it's gotten better over the years. Yeah. It used to be much more contentious, but uh, now at least we speak, share notes, and mm-hmm. reflect on what is happening in 
each of our political parties. Yeah. When uh, one of our former leaders left us, it was quite interesting to have that conversation <laughs> with him about it as well. Yeah. So it's interesting. My mother's EFF uh, finally managed to get her around, but my father, I think it will be, it's one of those things where it's too ingrained in the blood. Yeah. Uh, was someone who fought uh, against the apartheid system, was imprisoned for a number of years. Mm-hmm. So it's one of those things where we have to accept that it's all he knows and, uh, and mm-hmm. coexist in that man. Yeah, and the surname Tambu is such a yeah, big yeah. political, or rather surname in, in the South African politics, yeah. uh, looking at uh, Oliver Tambu. Uh, do you share any, 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 <laughs> any relationship? Do you have any relationship with uh, the, 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 the struggle stalwart, uh, Oliver Tambu? No, no, I do not. I get that all the time. I'm sure you'd imagine. <laughs> yeah. But I do not. The only sort of loose link that I would say there is is uh, Oliver Tambo and So my grandmother, that's a, a clan. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tambo. So my uh, grandmother, Wayangumbondo. But that's as far as it goes. It's uh, that type of loose lineage. Mm-hmm. But uh, I don't know of any real link, blood related. And I think it's a good thing that uh, it allows us to chart our own path politically. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And hailing from the Eastern Cape, how is the EFF uh, finding expression in, in the Eastern Cape? Is, it, is the EFF li- alive in the, in the Eastern Cape? Absolutely, absolutely. The EFF is making uh, necessary inroads in the Eastern Cape. I mean, they grew mm-hmm. as a province uh, marginally mm-hmm. now in the 2024 elections, I think mm-hmm. by a percentage point and a bit. So I think they're making a necessary inroads. And even when you go back home, you get to understand that the EFF is becoming appreciated and noted as a, fo- as a force to be reckoned with in the Eastern Cape. Our people contact us when they have challenges there, but also we're recognizable. So people are beginning to accept the EFF as a movement that is here to stay. And the Eastern Cape is a very difficult battleground mm-hmm. for any new political organization because a lot of its roots a lot of the roots of the liberation struggle in South Africa come from the Eastern Cape. A lot of the leaders of the former liberation movement hail from the Eastern Cape. Mm-hmm. Oliver Tambos, Winnie Mandela, Nelson Mandela. All of these big titans of anti-liberation struggle have ties to the ANC. So to get into that space and make the inroads that we've made as the EFF, I think is something uh, worth looking into and worth further investing in. I mean, now... The by-elections in uh, Buffalo City Metro showed mm-hmm. that we grew in uh, one of the wars, I think it was Ward 12, mm-hmm. by almost uh, three times from what we got in the last election. Mm-hmm. So I think there's a, there's, a, there's major progress being made there. You, Commissar, you give uh, racists and those that are anti-black, anti-pan-Africanist, uh, mm-hmm. sleepless nights. Uh, we've seen you being on the ground, very proactive, uh, taking the the puppets of the GNU the, or the puppets of white monopoly capital to task. We have seen what you have done to the Minister of Sports, Arts and Culture. You call him what? To Papa Joy. <laughs> Papa Joy. <laughs> Over the, 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 the misuse of uh, public funds. Yeah, yeah. And you have went to the office of the public protector to lay a complaint. Perhaps if you can just uh, take us into confidence as to what is happening here and what, is, what are the actions that uh, the EFF is taking? Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's correct. I have a very strong uh, dislike for racists <laughs> yeah. and racism in general. And I come from a school of thought that believes uh, in black consciousness in Steve Biko. So anything that resembles racism is something that I, I get very passionate about. And of course, the so-called government of national unity is one of the ultimate expressions of the betrayal of our people and the reversal of the gains that we've made politically, even if they are marginal. Because we have now cemented uh, rice, racists who are cooperating with organizations such as Afri Forum, who have blatantly shown that they don't have a respect for merit-based leadership or for Africans or for the necessary change that is needed in South Africa. The mm-hmm. former liberation movement now is in collaboration with the people of that nature. So the AFF is the necessary sort of antidote to this so-called GNU whose foundation is racism mm-hmm. and anti-blackness. So... Mm-hmm. We're holding them accountable. We've laid a complaint. The first one we did was against John Stienizen, the Minister of uh, Agriculture, who has made it his uh, mission to hire (laughs) underqualified, mediocre white people. (laughs) His fellow meticulous. His fellow (laughs) meticulous. And I think 
it's part of the arrogance and yeah. ignorance of racism, but also insecurity of uh, an undereducated individual because racism is ignorance and uh, foolishness. Mm -hmm. And it's rooted in an inability to appreciate your own mediocrity and a false sense of belief of your own superiority and supremacy. So John's DNA doesn't have respect for education because he thinks the whiteness of his skin is uh, mm -hmm. enough to to lead society, to lead sophisticated <coughs> institutions. And that's why he's able to recruit uh, his fellow DA underqualified members to lead uh, sections and spheres of government. So we reported him to the Ethics Committee because he told a lie in response to a question mm -hmm. which uh, we asked him mm -hmm. as to whether he's appointed any underqualified individuals into his staff complement. And uh, yeah. he said he had not done that. But the actual reality is that he had already appointed four individuals who are underqualified, yeah. and uh, he requested a deviation after the fact. So they've already been working in his office. They've been speaking on behalf of government in agricultural conferences. Mm -hmm. They've been uh, referred to as his special advisors in various forums. So he told the lie, and we reported him to the Ethics Committee and further reported him to the public protector as well, uh, including uh, Papa Joy, <laughs> <laughs> who we've also reported yeah. to. And uh, the one of uh, Gaten McKenzie is the most unfortunate thing. You know, in a society... That is riddled by crime like South Africa. You don't want your examples for the youth, for professionals to be someone who has the dodgy history that he has. And uh, we are of the belief that Gaten McKenzie is a representation of the failure of the correctional services system in South Africa. He's not rehabilitated. <laughs> he's not. He's not a rehabilitated <laughs> Why, <individual. Kubisa? laughs> No, because you should see even the, the fact, yeah. the way he's carrying himself when he's asked to account mm -hmm. on his trip to France. I was watching this press conference he had there. He's bragging about how he has a lifestyle that is better than that of a minister. He's flown to Abu Dhabi. Being a minister is actually a downgrade for him. He doesn't have an appreciation of what accountability is. And he thinks in order to counter accountability, he must brag about his mm -hmm. personal lifestyle. So you can see the low level of intellect that we're dealing with. And the, the spending that he did in Paris, France, is a spit in the face of the people of South Africa. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just proof that... It was wrong to, pick, to make a convict a minister. It's a wrong example that we're setting to the youth of South Africa, to a country that has such a high problem of crime. You, you strongly believe that there isn't a uh, value for money? Absolutely. I mean, uh, the air travel is 215,000. The ground travel is more than 400,000. And he violated the specific sections of the ministerial handbook as well as the code of ethics that governs members and members of parliament. So you're only supposed to travel with two staff in your compliment. He's already told us to travel yeah, with eight. This is the problem of hiring Mama Pantiti <laughs> into <Absolute>. cabinet. <laughs> also someone who doesn't pay attention. He doesn't seem to pay attention to the things he signs, the yeah. things he approves, because he answers a question and says uh, he's gone to France. This is how much he spent. Then when there's public backlash, he asks for explanations as to how much, why this much was spent. He says on Twitter, I didn't really go to the Olympics. The incoherence and also the love of social media is making him make uh, numerous mistakes and will probably be his downfall. So he must continue tweeting. He must continue using the phone. He's just going to be a gift that keeps on giving in terms of holding the GMU accountable for us. Mm -hmm. So what is the latest in as far as uh, Jonathan Hazen has been reported to the Ethics Committee? Mm -hmm. I've seen as well, he tried to brief the media and said, no, that's not how you report mm -hmm. the minister and all of that. Now, what is the latest in terms of holding uh, Jonathan Hazen uh, to account? Yeah, he's an illiterate who doesn't have an appreciation of the laws that govern him because it is part mm -hmm. and parcel of the Code of Ethics to maintain the integrity of the Parliament of South Africa Mm -hmm. and also to not break your oath of office. So mm -hmm. reporting him to ethics was a necessary measure. So his misunderstanding of the levers that can hold him accountable are uh, unfortunate and another further proof that he doesn't understand mm -hmm. the laws that govern him. We further reported him to the public protector as well. So both of them, him and Mackenzie, their matters are before the ethics committee and are before uh, the public protector. And I think the ethics committee will, uh, will have given him a couple of days to respond and then we'll refer that process to the committee itself for deliberation and uh, hopefully sanctions for those uh, appointments which are aware of unqualified DA members. Mm -hmm. So your impression of the first 100 days of the GNU, you've already taken to task these uh, clueless uh, ministers uh, that we've already talked about. But your impression of uh, the GNU, is it working? Is it advancing the interest of the poor and the marginalized in the main? Absolutely not. And uh, 
I think it is going to become one of those things where the middle class is being made to feel good about society, mm -hmm. whereas the material conditions of our people are not changing. Mm -hmm. So that's what it's becoming. It's becoming a feel-good exercise. And even if you listen to all of them when they reflect on the past 100 days, they don't talk about anything material. <laughs> they talk about the mood being uplifted. I don't know how they measure whether our moods are fine. And I don't know what that has to do with service delivery. But the language that they use is investor confidence. The mood has shifted. There's positivity. It's in in in, in like it's not meaningful changes uh, to anyone's life. And that's why it's going to be a feel good session for those who think that it's a multiracial government and who think that we're starting again from 1994. It's just those sort of fake feelings. And uh, mm -hmm. already in their first hundred days, we've seen that they are corrupt. They have the potential, the potential and propensity to be corrupt through DNAs and, and McKinsey. Mm -hmm. We've already seen that uh, there's there's been a so-called economic growth which is jobless. Mm -hmm. So that's zero point four percent so-called economic growth, mm -hmm. where only financial sector profits constituted mm -hmm. that growth shows you whose interest the GNU serves because it serves the banks, it serves the elites, mm -hmm. and it serves those who funded their political mm -hmm. campaigns. Mm -hmm. Because in the midst of that 0.4% jobless growth, there's been almost 50,000 job losses now in the first 100 days of the GNU, in the mining sector, in the agricultural sector. Those are sectors that are productive sectors of society in terms of employment. They are all on a decline. Uh, 158,000 jobs were already lost in the second quarter, according to Stats South Africa. So you can see that the only people who are going to benefit from this GNU is financial sector because everything around them, their thinking around economic growth is based on increasing foreign direct investment, mm -hmm. but no industrialization. So we don't know where the investment goes. And of course, already the EFF has highlighted that uh, there's massive profit shifting which is being done by these investors. So when they say that investors are coming, mm -hmm. but those investors are taking their profits offshore. So mm -hmm. they invest, they so-called invest in South Africa, but the liquid of the of of their investments is always taken out. I think almost 100 million already is being has been reported to be taken out of South Africa by these so-called investors. So it's extractive investment. There's no investment where you see houses being built, roads being built, infrastructure being developed. Mm -hmm. So it's a GN, the GNU is not a, it's not a product of South African interest. It doesn't serve South African interests. It mm -hmm. serves the pockets of the Oppenheimers, those who funded the DA, those who funded organizations like the IFP. Mm -hmm. uh, who are now in uh, this so-called alliance. And uh, our people shouldn't expect much. And uh, yeah. every 100 days, I think it's our responsibility to make mm -hmm. an assessment yeah. and keep them on their toes. Mm -hmm. And they always say, he who feeds you controls you. If yeah. you check, the EFF is not funded by any white yeah. establishment or the Oppenheimer families. Mm -hmm. uh, those that have benefited from uh, the Oppenheimers or these so-called donors uh, should be seen for who they are because... Uh, you can't just receive money from a white family or a white uh, monopoly capital ca establishment that doesn't have any regard for uh, uh, black pro progress or the interest of black people at heart. But you, 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 you create an impression that you are a party that is working to advance the interest of the people. And that is the only part, the EFF is the only party that uh, stands uh, with the people because it's not even part of the GNU. Now, when we look at the future of this country, the EFF always preach economic freedom in our lifetime. How are we going to go about this uh, with the GNU in the picture for now? Uh, what is our strategic uh, objective of achieving economic freedom in our lifetime? Look, now I think the immediate task of the economic freedom fighters as the most progressive force on the left in South Africa right mm -hmm. now is to ensure that we're an effective opposition and maintain and defend the assets of South Africans uh, to the best of our ability and exact effective mm -hmm. measures of accountability. So every cent must be accounted for. Every rand must be accounted for. We must ensure that our state-owned enterprises remain South African assets and that we don't allow this uh, approach mm -hmm. to privatize these assets, which is being approached through so-called public-private sector partnerships. Mm -hmm. That is uh, just a soft coup of state-owned enterprises because mm -hmm. ultimately the functions of these SOEs, uh, the internal functions of them are being handed over to the private sector and there's the state who are being left with... Uh, a shell of so-called controlling them. 
But in the main, there's contractual agreements for the generation and distribution of electricity at ESCOM. There's contractual agreements for the operations of the ports of South Africa, for the operation of the railway networks mm -hmm. with the private sector. So if you hand over the operation of these functions to the private sector and then call it public-private partnerships, mm -hmm. you are just deceiving our people because in essence, you've handed over the meaningful control to these businesses and you're just saying to South Africans, these things are not privatized, but they are very operations at, at the core of their existence. They are being controlled and they're being uh, ran by the private sector, which is generating massive profits off of that. So the EFF's main task, I think in the next uh, five years, but we do predict that this GNU won't make it to the next Absolutely. five years because mm -hmm. there's fundamental ideological differences that ought to lead it to crumble. And uh, if it doesn't crumble due to those fundamental ideological differences, then they're going to pursue the neoliberal policy perspectives which are dominant in the African National Congress today. Mm -hmm. So we have to ensure that we guard against uh, the DA's policy influence on the, the, mechaniz the mechanisms of running South Africa and uh, all of our state-owned enterprises. And I think we're doing a very good job thus far. So we have to continue to improve the qualitative output of uh, our governance, not only in parliament, but uh, in councils and legislatures. There must be unity in action and the quality of the output that we put out mm -hmm. into being an opposition and we protect the assets of the state. And I think, I mean, in Tswane now, we have got new MMCs, of course. Our MMCs across uh, municipalities have been doing very well in Ekurule and in Johannesburg, in Mohale City, in Nelson mm -hmm. Mandela Bay, uh, in the free state. And now we've got... Uh, MMC is in Tuan. And already we can see they've hit the ground running there, can, trying to cancel the MOU, the Memorandum of Understanding. Mm -hmm. that, with Afri Forum. With Afri Forum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which must be cancelled. <clears throat> so I see the media is trying to portray it as if the EFF is being a petty organization, fighting oh. people who want to cut grass for free. Nothing is for free when it comes to racists. Mm -hmm. And uh, we know that Afri Forum in the city of Tuan has been conducting this. Uh, uh, details in the memorandum of agreement mm -hmm. in white suburbs. You won't see them in mm. Soshanguve, you won't see them Black in Atridgeville, yeah. but you'll see them uh, in the white areas predominantly. But also, that memorandum of agreement, you know, the MMC of Environment sent it to me, but he said I mustn't share it. I didn't ask him what is the challenge. <laughs> yeah. And I, perhaps I must do that so that we can make it public. It includes very scary things. It gives them Afri Forum rights to do things that are beyond grass cutting, which the media is trying to portray now. Like Afri Forum has uh, the right to defend land from land invasion. Now you must ask yourself, how exactly is Afri Forum going to do that? Why are they going to guard against uh, land occupations? Mm -hmm. In what manner? Are they going to be using private security? Which uh, land occupations are they doing? And uh, mm -hmm. they're maintaining the ownership of the land, which is unjust in South Africa by such memorandums of agreement. So it has to be cut, and we hope that the city of Tswane will pursue that. Mm -hmm. And we, we talk about now uh, the GNU, uh, which has some to some extent sparked some ructions within the ANC. Now we understand there are factions that are pro and factions that are against yeah. uh, the GNU. You look at uh, what happened in Tswane, the ANC in Gauteng has taken a posture that seemed to undermine uh, the Democratic Alliance and the DA is not happy. They are chasing uh, the Banyas. premier of <laughs> how take left, right, and center. Yeah, yeah, Banyas yeah, yeah. and the Sufi. Uh, well, what do you make about this later, uh, latest latest uh, developments regarding the GNU? And are you uh, foreseeing a situation where uh, the EFF will join forces with other progressive uh, parties that undermine or that? Um, so antagonistic against the GNU? Look, I think I, I want to be cautious about speaking about Panyaza Lesufi because yeah. the next thing, uh, Balula will use this <laughs> podcast as a way to attack him because that's how insecure mm. he is. So if... Uh, the you will EFL, call them to uh, <laughs> Little House. They'll summon him to Little House because he was spoken well about in the podcast of the EFF. So that's yeah. the type of insecure individual we're dealing with mm -hmm. when you talk about the Secretary General of the NC. He's operating on insecurity. And um, I'm not sure why he's, uh, he's working like that. He's extremely uh, aggressive against anyone who speaks ill of the Democratic Alliance. But the Democratic Alliance is allowed to do and say whatever it wants mm -hmm. about certain leaders of the ANC. They call uh, some of the mafias, 
they call them mm-hmm. uh, what is that thing alexandra mafia yeah. paul mashati le panyaza le sufi they are constantly attacking them i mean they are in parliament now and i don't know if balula is aware of this they are in parliament now saying that they are not happy with the npa dropping the pala pala matter of course the eff is taking this to the constitutional court uh, the matter will be heard now in november but the da is not changing its stance in terms of being antagonistic to the nc mm-hmm. but figile balula is insisting as if he's a secretary general of the gnu or something <laughs> <laughs> that people must have kids gloves when they enter yeah. the DA. So you can see that he's highly highly compromised as an individual. You know there was a tweet that I wrote about he frequents ENCA like mm-hmm. it's as if he's got a contractual yeah. obligation to go that, to yeah. ENCA. <laughs> so we point out that look you know the stakeholdership in ENCA is uh, the Remgro mm-hmm. which uh, belongs to and is chaired by Johan Rupert mm-hmm. has a meaningful stake of ownership on e-media which uh, ENCA belongs to mm-hmm. and uh, so we make a suggestion that there's a nefarious relationship between the frequency of Mbalula going to ENCA mm-hmm. and uh, what he says there because he uses it as a platform to attack anyone who dares criticize this government of national unity of theirs mm-hmm. so i write that he sends me a message on twitter on tm <laughs> yeah Uh, I've never disrespected you like that. I've always respected was he th- you. Was he threatening you? <laughs> I don't think he was threatening me because yeah. a lot of people think when we speak about these people that we they don't have interactions with them uh, in one way or another at a personal level. Mm-hmm. So he, he makes those emotional types of things, those types of emotional blackmail. So you can see he's extremely sensitive as an individual. He doesn't want people to be critical of him but he's critical of everyone. I mean there's something that's very disturbing that he does. He doesn't refer to the EFF as the EFF. Whenever he talks about the EFF it's Malim. Mm. Malim, Malim, Malim. Mm. And it's undermining and it's it serves a particular purpose to paint a picture that there's no organization. It's an individual and anything that happens there is based around that individual. The president of the EFF has called him out on that. That why when you talk about the DA you say DA, you don't say Helen Zile. You don't say John Stenis. Mm-hmm. But when you talk about the EFF he's always malema 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 it's personalized. Yeah, mm-hmm. so he's got the capacity to be aggressive but he's got a very thin skin. So that's why I said when uh, we started to talk about this segment that we don't want to put Panyaza into trouble. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. we think that he's uh, he's mm-hmm. defending his organization in the correct manner. Mm-hmm. He's made an assessment that they are working with a historical enemy. and uh, that historical enemy was uh, arrogant in their approach of trying to establish a provincial government of national unity they made unreasonable demands and uh, panyaza lewang maile we think are, are on the right track mm-hmm. because it mustn't be painted as if this gnu is the be all and end all of what we were pursuing in terms of the struggle for the liberation of the liberation of our mm-hmm. people so they are they they've got the correct posture into how to interact with uh, racists Yeah and they must not allow themselves to be bullied for that. I think perhaps to protect them from being someone we can leave it at. Yeah. That. I don't know if the the someone can extend to someone like the secretary general of the SACP so <laughs> because he equally lashes out at the Yeah yeah yeah, yeah yeah. Comrade Sol is, uh, is doing good work. <laughs> uh, Thumbs uh, up to him. Uh, yeah yeah yeah. It's a, it's a job of uh, a communist party. We haven't seen the communist party speak with ideological fortitude in a very long time. We don't know whether it's because Soima Pele wasn't sent to be a cabinet minister and is unhappy. We don't know the internal dynamics of it. But at face value, the role of an ally, uh, which the Communist Party is supposed to be, is mm-hmm. to do what they're doing. And Mapaile is correct when he says it's as if the ANC is an alliance partner of the DA because it is the perspectives ideologically and policy-wise mm-hmm. uh, and politically which the ANC seems to listen to. more than it does the to its alliance partners i mean helen zilek for weeks calls panyazeli sufi a rogue and then you hear mbalula calling him rogue as well so he even adopts the language mm-hmm. of the strategic enemy to characterize his own comrades so you can see the level of compromise so mm-hmm. i think it's a necessary check and balance for them whether it's sincere or not but uh, we need progressives uh, everywhere Mm-hmm. to stand up and be critical of this alliance with the yeah. DA. But we haven't seen uh, the same being said by the likes of uh, Ablain Zimande. Mm. <laughs> Why is he so mum on this? Yeah, Ablain Zimande <laughs> has, has been compromised for a very long time. Uh, he's been compromised. We don't actually know why he's been retained as a minister. There's something that we need to look into. Perhaps the EFF as well because he's got a history of uh, corruption within the services sector, services sector. 
-hmm. when he was the Minister of Higher Education. He's now the Minister of Science and Technology because the departments were split up mm -hmm. to, in order to accommodate uh, the political maneuvering that Cyril mm -hmm. was doing mm -hmm. after 1994. So we've got a large cabinet with a lot of deputy ministers. Some departments like transport have two deputy ministers. And it's just a mess in mm -hmm. order to accommodate uh, political maneuvering. You. at the taxpayer's expense. So I don't foresee Blaine's Zimande saying anything because he's enjoying the benefits of <laughs> he's being captured. a minister. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, just like as the DA, the DA prior to the elections were uh, against Cyril. They even formed what they termed uh, the Moonshot Pact, multi-party, yeah, yeah. whatever. Yeah, yeah. But now, after the elections, mm -hmm. they, they had to quickly... Uh, make amendments and even yeah, came yeah. up with what do you call these things of theirs that they signed? The, that statement of intent. Yeah, the statement of yeah. intent and all of that. But now, uh, when we look at the role that is played by the progressive uh, caucus, especially in parliament or the progressive parties, we have seen the emergence of uh, the MK and some have were quick to celebrate to say the GNU is lasting longer than the progressive caucus. Yeah. What is your, your standpoint on that? There's no such a thing. The progressive caucus is still in place. Eh? Mm -hmm. It's just that we don't make the mistake of thinking just because we're in a progressive caucus, we can't have political interactions in a robust manner mm -hmm. with those we belong to within the progressive caucus. I'll give you an example. We don't agree with uh, ATM on its policy perspectives around immigration and immigration laws. Mm -hmm. They've got a very different posture to us. Mm -hmm. But we don't agree with them on that, but we belong to the same progressive caucus as them. We don't agree with the, I think it's the CCC, uh, Colored Party, mm -hmm. on some of its perspectives when it comes to uh, cross-border travel between the Eastern Cape and the Western Cape. Their president has said some very, very... Mm -hmm. Alarming things about that. Uh, people of the Eastern Cape uh, over flooding the Western Cape, mm -hmm. over flooding services there. Uh, similar to like Helen Zilla has once called people of the Eastern Cape immigrants when they go to the city of Cape Town. Mm -hmm. So there's contradictions within any caucus, but we don't allow ourselves to be muted mm -hmm. by that. So the Progressive Caucus is still alive. <laughs> uh, we vote together on many relevant policy perspectives and issues in Parliament. But that should not stop us uh, from being robust and to avoid debate around each other. I mean, they've adopted now mm -hmm. the MK party, that is a constitution. I think they were presenting it a week or two ago. Mm -hmm. We're interrogating it because we're in a progressive caucus with them. And uh, they seem to be drifting further and further from what can be called progressive. There's nothing progressive about parliamentary sovereignty. There's nothing progressive about seeing traditional houses and... Uh, royalty must have powers to create law as if it's Bantustan yeah. or some isolated thing. There's nothing progressive or Marxist about that. There's nothing progressive about centering an entire constitution around an individual who has powers to decree what must happen, when, where, and how. Yeah. There's nothing progressive about not having internal democracy and elective conferences. Mm -hmm. But we're still working together because they make claims that they're anti-colonial and all sorts of things. So their posture generally ideologically, there's things that we'll find commonplace. Just as we do with the ANC, there's things where we find commonplace with. But we don't agree with the military, military conscription of kids, sending the young boys to the military by force. Mm -hmm. We don't agree to sending impregnated young girls mm -hmm. who are more often than not impregnated because of abuse and sexual violence. We don't agree with sending them to Robben Island. Mm -hmm. So there's many things that... Yeah. must be interrogated so that people can self-correct hopefully. So that is an ideological discussion that must be allowed. They have as well in their constitution. And I know they're going to see this and say we're obsessed with them. We're, we're, we have a duty to interrogate the thinking of those we have relationships with. Mm -hmm. They have now in their constitution some clause that says they mustn't ins insult people, even if people are critical of that. I think it's the highest level of intellectual cowardice. Like <laughs> yeah. Serious, serious cowardice. Mm -hmm. Because... They want to frame any interrogation of what they say and what they stand for as an attack. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I think that's cowardly. And I think they, they use that to try to present themselves as civil as opposed, of course, to an EFF that is so-called an organization of insults. There's nothing insulting about asking you what do you mean by parliamentary sovereignty. Mm -hmm. And uh, they should ask some of those who have joined them now what they think about that. Yeah. <clears throat> Talking about those who have joined the 
MK, some of them um, come from the EFF. And I yeah. know um, you, you like speaking in riddles, Komisa, <laughs> for, <laughs> some, for some, some reasons. Yeah. But some of those that left uh, the, the, the EFF did not hold the views they are holding now. Yeah, yeah. What do you call that? Is that betrayal of the revolution? Or it's 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 man it's compromise of character ideology over money it's betrayal of the self i think uh, first and foremost there are many comrades yeah. who have left us and i don't have a problem with people leaving it's their democratic right to associate with whatever political party mm -hmm. that they want to and uh, who, who wish them well in whatever they do in the future but we are going to interrogate them as to what informs certain decisions and what informs certain utterances. So it's betrayal of self. The president of the EFF uh, posts the perhaps most significant departure of the former deputy president of the EFF, makes a characterization that that was an infiltration that happened in the EFF. And his manifest, the manifestation of that infiltration was at the level of ideas, fundamentally. So we can speculate around infiltration of sabotage for electoral purposes, and which is why perhaps we performed badly of in the province of KwaZulu Natal in particular, mm -hmm. where certain individuals were recruited into the EFF mm -hmm. a couple of months before elections, and then those individuals left and were followed by a certain person as well, mm -hmm. by Floyd, so that you don't see I'm speaking in the <laughs> Sure. So <laughs> we, can, yeah. we can speculate about that mm -hmm. as a form of infiltration, where people were being trained in the EFF to go and take our knowledge systems and expertise and methods of running the organization they learned them internally, sabotaged the electoral processes internally, and then left with that expertise that they were trained with in the EFF to go and try and replicate that into the MK. That's one level of infiltration. Mm. The other level of infiltration is at the level of ideas, where you compromise your ideas uh, at, the expense, at the expense of the organization and for monetary purposes. And because, of course, further, there's been a better electoral performance by the, your mm. opponents. So MK party, of course, performed better than us. And at the moment where the EFF required and needed a defense and a closing of ranks, individuals went for what looks like greener pastures. So mm -hmm. there's a betrayal of self, and that betrayal of self manifests itself. For example, I can't say that I had a necessarily good or bad relationship with Floyd, or that we were friends or enemies, or that now we're enemies. I, I don't think about political relations in that sense. But I know his thinking. Like I've worked intimately with how he thinks because of the responsibilities both of us have had in the EFF. So a lot of our responsibilities revolve around policy development, writing, articulation of things. I mean, I was the spokesperson of the EFF. There are certain things that we'd have to bounce off him mm -hmm. and interact with him. The drafting of uh, manifesto ahead of elections, successive elections since, because I've been in the CCT since 2019. Mm -hmm. Drafting of policy discussion documents, drafting of manifestos. So I have an intimate understanding of how he rationalizes and how he thinks. Mm -hmm. So when <laughs> the MK party adopts parliamentary sovereignty, you know I'm like, him. but I know he doesn't I know believe hand in that. <laughs> I know the handwriting. <laughs> but he doesn't believe in yeah. that. And he's on multiple occasions stipulated why he doesn't believe in that. Because parliamentary sovereignty is a road, mm -hmm. it's a very slippery slope because you're going to allow parliament to have the powers to vote on irrevocable rights of individuals. Mm. Like you're going to vote on uh, the death sentence and there's no constitution to keep you in check. You're going to vote on the persecution of your political opponents and there's no constitution to keep you in check. Mm -hmm. I know he doesn't believe in it. He dismissed, uh, that's what Sikha was saying uh, the other day, he dismissed Zwanele uh, Mani and Busu Mkobana who were pushing that in the EFF. Perhaps that's another form of ideological infiltration that was being attempted because the EFF is, believes in the constitution. Mm -hmm. So just because we want to amend the constitution to allow for the expropriation of land without compensation doesn't mean we don't believe in the constitution because the constitution is the one that provides the provision for amendment. Mm -hmm. So we believe in the constitution of South Africa. Now, our brother goes that side, he starts advocating for parliamentary sovereignty, he's advocating for the scrapping Mm -hmm. of the constitution of South Africa is advocating for traditional houses and royal houses mm -hmm. to have the powers to make legislation and laws. I mean, that is the most anti-Marxist thing that you can say. That is feudalism, mm -hmm. where you want uh, individuals just because they are born of certain blood to make laws. That is yeah. an undermining of a democratic process. And that is not to say that uh, traditional houses and traditional leaders have no place mm -hmm. 
or role to play in South Africa. They do, and our constitution allows. I mean, we've got customary law in South Africa. So they've got a very good pride in place as custodians of our history. But yeah. a Marxist can't be championing such things. So that must be that type of interrogation is not an attack. Mm -hmm. We're just saying we know how this person thinks, mm -hmm. and this is not in line with what he thinks. And it just further proves to us that this was not an ideological decision. Something else motivated it. And of course, we'll speculate whether it's money, mm -hmm. whether it's opportunism, but this is not an ideologically rooted. Yeah. What do you think is influencing his uh, theoretical thinking at this point in time? Because you've already alluded to the fact that this is anti Marxist Leninist and all of that. Mm. But now, who do you think is fueling his thinking or his uh, school of thoughts at, at this point in time? Because we know MK now that the person who has got the absolute powers to appoint and dismiss it's mm. uh, yeah, Jacob yeah. Zuma, yeah. Uh, which is in the constitution. And when we look at the EFF, the EFF is the most democratic political party. Mm. There's conferences and mm. uh, all of that. Now we're gravitating towards our third uh, people's, uh, National People's Assembly. But when we look at what may be persuading uh, mm. Floyd at this point in time to to be aligning with what the MK believes in. Who, who, who are playing? Who are the, what are the forces that are at play? I don't think there's any intellectual persuasion that is happening in the <laughs> in that organization. <laughs> and I say that with all due respect. Yeah. Any, I don't think there's any, anything intellectual guiding. Because they speak about that the core, one of their core objectives is uniting uh, black people uh, mm -hmm. on all progressive forces. You know, uh, Comrade Jacob Zuma has been alive for 82 years. When did he come to that realization that there needs to be a unity of black people? He was a state president mm. for almost 10 years. When did he come to the realization that there needs to be a uniting of, of black people and progressives? And why must we now all unite under him when he served as a president of the oldest liberation movement in the continent and never pursued an agenda to unite black people? So wh where where does that come from? So there's no intellectual persuasion to what they are saying, and I I I'm not convinced that it's anything different in terms of what he has been doing all of his political life. Jacob Zuma thrives on victimhood, mm -hmm. like he survives of it. His his pol his political posture, his political thinking, yeah, is victimhood. Ever since uh, the the saga of Kwezi in the early two thousands. He's always been uh, the saga of when they called him a Zulu boy, yeah. uh, the saga of when he was dismissed by Tabumbeki, mm -hmm. the saga now when he was he, he lost the conference, uh, when he was supporting Gwasa Zuma, the 2021 mm -hmm. unrests, his arrest uh, for, by, as a result of the Zondo Commission, which mm -hmm. was saying he must come and present himself. He's got a track record of surviving because he's a victim and presenting himself as someone who needs to be protected because there's this constant attack on him. Mm. And he's got this dual membership now, yeah. ANC and MK. He still wants to rescue the ANC. That's another <laughs> thing that no one wants to talk about, that the fundamental objective of that organization when it was formed was that it's going to rescue the ANC from itself or from the current neoliberal tra trajectory that it is taking. And another annoying and irritating thing that irritates me the most is that they've constitutionalized uh, infiltration, that uh, you can be stay a member there. If you're a councillor in an organization, don't join yet. Let's wait for 2026. So keep your seat there so you have dual membership. What type of dual membership is this where only one political party knows about the dual membership and the other political party doesn't? Mm. So it's conniving, it's scheming, it's victimhood. That is the political posture and ideological persuasion. They've taken it from their leader. We're always under attack. Mm -hmm. We're the victims. Let's unite around our leader. Let's protect our leader. Let's not interact with people who are trying to interrogate our ideological thinking and policies. They're mm -hmm. attacking us. Let's close shop here because we're always under attack. That is how uh, Comrade Jacob Zuma has always rationalized politics and always placed himself in a point to launch a political rise because he's always under attack. And that is the persuasion that is governing that entire organization. Now they give him powers to decree things because he must protect the MK party from infiltration while it's trying to infiltrate everyone else. Hmm. It's just ironic. Yeah. So there's nothing persuasive ideologically, mm -hmm. I think, that is happening over there. But of course, we work together on uh, certain issues in parliament and it ends there. But uh, we mustn't expect to give each other roses. We're in political contest. They surpassed us in the recent elections. Well done to them. 
but we have to continue to compete politically and interrogate our ideas so that we can better each other. We can't have a fake unit. Mm -hmm. So if we really want to be progressives, part of being a progressive is interrogating each other and challenging each other and challenging yeah. each other's thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, recently, we have seen uh, the former public protector, EFF MP, yeah, yeah. Bustem Kwebane, uh, advocate Bustem Kwebane, uh, leaving the EFF or announcing that she will be leaving the organization and resigning from parliament. One of the reasons he gave is that it's very difficult to be an MP of a political party uh, without the necessary numbers. You are an MP, Commissar. You have first-hand uh, uh, experience, and we've seen uh, how you have uh, been debating in Parliament, how the EFF has put forward motions and all of that. Is it difficult at all, or is there any truth to what she was trying to say, to say if you're an MP of a political party without numbers, therefore it becomes a problem. And this leads to this question. Does an opposition fail to fulfill its obligation because of its numbers? Because I believe by virtue of being in parliament, it means you have got the role to play. Mm. Uh, what is your standpoint on what she, she just said uh, upon her departure? Look, I, I have a sense of sympathy for Advocate Busio Mkwewan. Mm -hmm. Because if you read the letter that she wrote to the leadership of the EFF, you can hear that this is a woman who's battered and bruised. Like she's been under attack from uh, the system for a long time. And mm -hmm. she keeps taking successive blows in court, in the pursuing of her pension, uh, which she worked hard for and she deserves. So the lynching of uh, professionals like Advocate Mkwebana and uh, Dr. Trope, uh, Dr. Judge John Trope, are things that are quite painful. And I think they're also human beings, like they get tired. Mm -hmm. I don't know if uh, Advocate Mkwebana will end up joining another political party. Her husband is in the MK party. I don't know if that's what informed her resignation. I don't know the circumstances around it. But I have a sense of sympathy because she's someone who's been in constant battles and on the losing side of those battles. And perhaps a parliament where the EFF does not have certain amounts of numbers is uh, part of something that traumatizes her or she finds difficult being on the end of uh, constantly fighting. And EFF work requires a certain level of enthusiasm and applying of yourself, but also accountability. So it might be fighting battles on numerous fronts and then also confronting the reality that we are fighting as an opposition that has a role to hold the executive un accountable. And that role will come with difficulty because we don't have the numbers at certain times to ensure that certain things can happen. And you shouldn't mm -hmm. be discouraged by that because the principle is what should guide you. So perhaps she's tired from fighting numerous and other battles and wants to go focus on her family. And we wish her well with that. If she ends up joining another political party, well, good luck to her. Mm -hmm. But uh, we'll continue because uh, when, when we joined the EFF, the EFF was, uh, I think, about 6%, quite about 6% in uh, in parliament and it's been able to make a mark in South African politics without having a majority of the numbers in parliament. We've been able to guide legislative processes, make meaningful contributions Absolutely. in legislatures in the past 11 years and uh, to a point where even we forget that we don't have the numbers mm -hmm. that are expected to do this. So it's yeah. about your attitude, it's about how you approach it and perhaps she needs time to rest because she's been confronted by many battles and good mm -hmm. luck to her. Yeah, I, I find that statement very unfounded uh, that she said because mm. the EFF has revolutionized the politics of South Africa. Mm. Uh, mm. A lot of young people got attracted to parliamentary proceedings because of the EFF, because of the radicalism and also the fact that the EFF uh, are known as the Red Berets and they, they wear red overalls. Now you see MK wearing, uh, <laughs> what do yeah, you call yeah. this? Uh, camouflage. <laughs> camouflage. Yeah. Uh, it's not far-fetched to say it's, it's it's inspired by the EFF. Now, Commissar, as we prepare for the third um, National People's Assembly, yeah. what are your thoughts on the upcoming conference or assembly of the EFF and your thoughts also on the people who are leaving or those that have left. I know in the past, the CIC, uh, President Julius Malim has said that uh, the EFF is not holiday in. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Once yeah, you leave, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you left, you can't come in and out. But he has said to uh, former Deputy President Floyd Chibambo, if he wishes to come, he may come back. Yeah. 
as we 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 move towards the conference, what do you think needs to happen? Look, uh, I think it's part of parcel of many of the constitutional amendments that uh, we will make. A, there's going to be a discussion about the provision of people returning if they've gone to other political parties. And, uh, of course, we've released the discussion documents that deal with uh, many spheres of society, economy, media, mm-hmm. agriculture, and many questions that uh, pertain to the vision that we have as the EFF for the country. Mm-hmm. Of course, the central command team, which I sit on, rejected the proposal that uh, Floyd Shibabu can come back whenever he wants. He'll have to be subjected to whatever constitutional decisions and amendments are made at the Third National People's Assembly. So that is off the table. But uh, I think that uh, all of the delegates which are going to be going to the National People's Assembly must read intimately the discussion documents of the EFF because a lot of time went into crafting those and in consideration with many societal developments and phenomena. So I think uh, the caliber of delegates that will come to that conference are going to renew the mandate of the leadership, of course, but also renew the policy perspectives of the EFF, of course, based on the founding manifesto of the EFF. So let's all internalize those documents, but also not shy away from having a conversation on the leadership question. Mm-hmm. Uh, the EFF does, of course, have a unique type of conference because we base a lot of it around the ideological perspectives that we're pursuing and what is happening in society and what we need to change and adapt to. Mm-hmm. I mean, the a document on the battle of ideas, for example, reflects on uh, <coughs> the so-called GNU and reflects on what the EFF needs to do, reflects mm-hmm. on the shifts from uh, the 2019 elections and from the past five years in terms of how we're treated by the media in South Africa. The, in the beginning, I mean, I think the reflection states that ahead of the 2019 elections, mm-hmm. a lot of the strategies by the Stratcom establishment was to degenerate and uh, depict mm-hmm. the leadership of the EFF in a certain light, to put a plaster on us of VBS, put a plaster on us on, of being corrupt and a smear campaign on the lifestyles of the leadership of the EFF. So they used the typical character assassination method that they did with Winnie Mandela when they tried to paint her as this terrorist who was necklacing people who killed Stompy Sepe, which of course was incorrect. So they tried to utilize those methods that they used on Winnie Mandela against the president of the EFF and against Peter Mukabe and many leaders who, when they are too radical and too progressive, they run a smear campaign on them as an individual. Mm-hmm. That failed with the EFF. Mm-hmm. So the, doc- the document uh, notes that shift, and that shift then went into a direct ideological critique of the EFF and its ideological and policy perspectives, where the media, you can see now, are directly trying to question our policies, whether they are sustainable, whether they will work, the DA declaring us enemy number one, characterizing any possibility of us being in government as a doomsday. Mm-hmm. So there was a shift from... a uh, an attack and smear campaign into an ideological war, which was fully funded by the Oppenheimers and the establishment. Mm-hmm. So our delegates should have an intim- intimate relationship with those documents, but also have an intimate relationship on the leadership question in the branches. Discuss who must be elected, why, who must not be elected, why. They must have that conversation because a conference entails that. It's both ideas and elections of membership mm-hmm. and of leadership rather. Mm-hmm. So we expect them to have that robust debate in their ranks and uh, hopefully make those contributions. There's a discussion around the dissolving of the student command, converting it to the youth command. Many student activists uh, don't agree. Some do. Some are saying they can operate as a mutually exclusive. Let's have those debates uh, in the structure of the EFF and make sure we have a, mm-hmm. a nice conference. It is indeed the battle of ideas. Yeah, yeah. Who do you think should lead the EFF going forward and why? And <laughs> also, <laughs> also, who do you think should uh, deputize uh, commander in chief. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't want it to be sanctioned. So it is against the yeah. the the rules of yeah. the guidelines of the EFF's conference, a third national people's assembly to yeah. do public declarations in the leadership. Because I saw there was an article yeah, yeah, that you yeah, retweeted. Yeah. <laughs> and as I'm asking this question. No, and you know, there's yeah. some whispers that uh, I'm behind the creation. I'm not uh, behind the creation of any speculation in the media space. Mm-hmm. Funny enough, the author of that article was, was calling me the whole week. Mm-hmm. And I think I had a sense that there's some wrong question that is going to be asked. Yeah. And I just avoided him. I'm probably going to call him uh, within this week and yeah. then tell him that I knew that you were working on something like this. And I don't want to be 
sometime of the performance. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, I think it's interesting. It's good that the EFF is having a conversation. Uh, the media has picked it up and uh, it shows you that there's internal democracy in the EFF. So I saw the speculations around Dr. Mbuiseni, Commissar Vianney Pambo, former Secretary General Godrich Kati. Perhaps those are discussions which are happening in the ranks of the EFF. Perhaps they are not. But it gives you a sense that uh, this is what internal democracy looks like, that people uh, are reflecting on who they must elect and we're moving on from uh, people who think that a chapter of people leaving the EFF is going to be the end of the EFF. The EFF is going to prove a lot of people wrong because we've got a lot of depth in leadership and quality in leadership in the EFF that comes from all spheres of society, from professionals, from academia, from the student movement, uh, from the trade union sector, from the workers' sector. We've got a lot of people who are in love with the ideas of the EFF and want to continue to take it forward. Yeah. So to have an internal discussion on the leadership question at a branch level, at an organizational level, is healthy. But uh, we must not, of course, utilize the media as an instrument to wage uh, con political contests uh, yeah. in the EFF. And we must, of course, also behave appropriately on social media platforms and not put the organization into disrepute. But we mm -hmm. must encourage our branches and our membership not to be afraid mm -hmm. of making honest reflections on yeah. the type of leadership that they think is necessary for the economic emancipation movement. Mm -hmm. You have played uh, key roles in the EFF. You have been the head of uh, presidency. You have been the spokesperson. And currently you are in the CCT which is uh, the highest decision-making body in between conferences. Yeah, yeah. How do you feel about such responsibilities or being entrusted with that responsibility to work in the office of the president, to be the spokesperson, the mouthpiece? I don't want to say this being doctor, but <laughs> the <laughs> mouthpiece of the organization yeah. and also a member of uh, the CCT. Look, it's a, it's a humbling experience. <laughs> I always mm -hmm. say the EFF uh, has been able to, to teach us a lot of responsibility and a sense of responsibility at a very young age. I mean, I got elected into the Central Command team when I was 22. Mm -hmm. I served in the 6th Democratic Parliament when I was 24, became a spokesperson when I was 24. So you can see the EFF makes a lot of investment on its youth, and it's quite humbling that it's an organization that is not afraid of its young people unlike many other organizations in this country where youth is 40, 50 year olds. You know, when someone is being called the young lion mm. and you're approaching your 50s, that's the yeah. culture in the, in the <laughs> ANC. <laughs> young lion very, of 50. <laughs> yeah, they have a very yeah. different understanding of, of yeah. youth. I mean, Fikile Mbalula is still referred to as a young man, mm -hmm. but he's approaching, I think he's 50 actually, I'm not sure. Yeah. But he's, he's, when they talk about possible successors to Ramaphosa, they talk about people who are in their 40s and 50s, and that to them is young. Malusi Kikaba is young in the terms of reference of the ANC. So Mzondi uh, Lemasina is young in the terms of reference of the ANC because they are so used to being led by people in their 70s and 80s. So the EFF has shifted the culture of who gets responsibility and why and doesn't delay its youth in terms of giving it responsibilities as a method of training them and equipping them to uh, lead the organization uh, currently or in the future. So it's been a humbling experience to be given uh, those responsibilities, and it's taught us a lot in a short space of time. I always say we grew up in the EFF. We know nothing else. We've never been members of anything else. So to us, it becomes very personal when there's an attack on the EFF, and uh, we won't stand by and watch attempts to infiltrate it or distort it or distort its message or distort its character in any way or form. We will, will be harsh on sleeper agents, will be harsh up, up against those who sow doubt and division within the movement, because this movement is all we know, mm -hmm. and it has given us the responsibilities that you've mentioned. Mm -hmm. So we can't just watch it with away or allow anyone to try to distort mm -hmm. its direction. How is your relationship with uh, the CIC, uh, Julius Malima, and how has <laughs> it been working with him? Some uh, who don't know him describe him as a dictator. Uh, nothing further <laughs> from the truth. Nothing yeah. further from the truth. The commander in chief of the EFF is an extremely humble individual. He's firm, uh, maybe sometimes difficult, but he sticks to his truth. Uh, he expects uh, quality, he expects results, he expects accountability when you're given a task. And he's a fair person, he's a fair individual. Uh, he doesn't uh, throw anyone in the dustbin, he doesn't have a dustbin for anyone. 
So it's quite, uh, it's contrary to popular belief. He's anything but a dictator. He's very consultative. He picks a person's brain, try to understand where they're coming from, why they make certain suggestions. And he's forthright and he's honest and he's direct. Mm -hmm. So I think we're not used to that type of leadership in South Africa. We're used to manipulative people, people who speak with forked tongues, who will say something behind closed doors and say mm -hmm. another in public. People who are not direct, people who are just always uh, maneuvering, you must always be worried. What are they plotting? What are they planning in the dark? Mm -hmm. He's not that type of person. And because yeah. of his forthrightness and honesty, there's a misconception that he's a dictator. There's nothing further from the truth. There's no dictator that would allow internal democracy in the way mm -hmm. that we see in the EFF. And internal democracy is expensive. <laughs> yes, These elective conferences cost money. Mm -hmm. So it would be very convenient to say this thing is too expensive. We're coming from an election. We've had some losses uh, in terms of our electoral performance, which has affected our allocations from the IEC and legislatures in terms of how we sustain the organization. Mm -hmm. We could have said a dictator would have used these uh, electoral results to say that we can't afford to go to an elective conference. Let's delay it a bit. He doesn't do that. Mm -hmm. He remains committed to internal democracy, despite that it's expensive in terms of running and costs. I saw something extremely stupid uh, before I forget it. <laughs> <laughs> sure. On uh, social media, where someone is uh, circulating a clip where they say, where the president says, they, they take it out of context, where the president says the IEC gave us 35 million mm -hmm. uh, in allocation and we yeah. used that for ahead of the 10th anniversary. So mm -hmm. there's some idiots who are saying that that's why we didn't contest the rigging of results because IEC gave us 35 mm -hmm. million. They don't know that the IEC gives political parties grants, like gives them money mm -hmm. for being registered political parties and based on the representation that you have in legislatures, councils, and in parliament. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to dismiss that stupidity yeah. because there's, there's that doing the rounds. But to, to continue with my point, mm -hmm. internal democracy costs money, and by losing uh, representations of seats in parliament, we've lost uh, our allocations, which are statutory allocations given to political parties. Mm -hmm. But still, the president and commander-in-chief has remained uh, committed to that internal, internal democracy, and that should show you. Yeah. That there's nothing dictatorship about it. Yeah. And also equally, I think I've have got that experience of him really allowing us to come up with ideas. Yeah, I yeah. mean, this is a perfect example of the EFF podcast. Yeah. Uh, we always uh, throw ideas. He lets us be. We bring people that uh, we think are going to add value to the podcast and all of that. So yeah, I don't yeah, have yeah, that yeah, experience yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that is being peddled. Yeah. But now, when we look at your your role, you have exposed scandals, including the two-pot system, yeah. the loopholes yeah. that lies or that comes with that two-pot system. And you have already written to the Minister of Finance, in Kodongwane, earlier, way before yeah. the two-pot system was implemented. Uh, what are some of the findings that you, you unearthed when we look at the... The, the fraud that mm. happened that, um, you know, uh, poor workers had to, to experience, especially being unable to access their pension funds. Yeah, yeah. So on the 12th of January, we wrote to the Minister of Finance, alerting him, and that was on the back of a Financial Sector Conduct Authority report, that mm -hmm. uh, there's municipalities and private security companies that are making deductions from the salaries of workers but not paying those deductions towards their health benefits mm -hmm. and their retirement funds. So they are ostensibly stealing that money. And there's companies and municipalities that owe for almost 20 years. So there's people who have died with not accessing their pensions because they'll always be given a runaround. We wrote to the Department of Labor 12th of January. So then we wrote to the Minister of Finance uh, to also tell us whether there's any state-owned enterprises which have hired private security companies which are implicated in the theft of pension funds. Mm -hmm. you must do that audit, give them three months to repay that money or cancel their contracts. Because we mm -hmm. were saying we don't want the state to be complicit in the violation of Section 13A of the Pension Funds Act, which speaks to uh, the necessity of making the necessary contributions to the UIF and pension funds of, of workers. He ignored us for almost eight months. And then the two-part system, uh, the Revenue Laws Amendment Bill came into effect and there was a, a crisis that was uh, emerging. People were trying to make withdrawals from the two-part system. They'll be told all sorts of excuses. The mm -hmm. system is down, there's technical challenges, or the money is just not there because your employer has not been paying it. And with mm -hmm. municipalities, it's even more scary because they're governed by political parties. They hire municipal managers and city managers who are deducting this money mm -hmm. from uh, the salaries of municipal workers but not paying it 
toward their pension funds. So now mm-hmm. that when the two support system uh, comes into light, the pension fund adjudicator, which is an office within Treasury, and they know Kotongwana, comes out and says the people have been complaining about this. But we're like, we try to tell you, we could have avoided this crisis if in the eight months when you were ignoring the EFF, you had implemented what we were suggesting. So uh, he's still not extremely cooperative, but you know, Kotongwana has a history of uh, pension fund theft. <laughs> so uh, maybe that is why, because yeah. he was accused of stealing 100 million of textile workers back in 2011. So mm. he's not proactive, maybe because he knows something is wrong or why it's wrong, or maybe he's complicit in it as well. But we've uh, since written to the Speaker of Parliament through the Chief Whip, the Secretary General of the EFF, that there must be an ad hoc committee established to investigate pension fund theft. We will call everyone who's been involved over the past 20 years mm-hmm. to come and account and hopefully do the necessary sort of reform that is needed in the pension fund sector to ensure that workers' interests are protected. But further to this, the two-part system is not serving its envisioned purpose because uh, a lot is being taxed, and we told mm-hmm. SARS recently in Parliament that we did not do the necessary tax uh, education of the financial implications to our people. So now our people are withdrawing 30000 they only get 19000 SARS is accumulating a lot of money. Mm-hmm. And even the financial sector, the banks are accumulating money from withdrawals. So the financial sector is the one that is benefiting the most from this, and SARS as well. So SARS is going to come back and say to us, that uh, they've accumulated this much revenue collection, but it's on the back of uh, mm. of the salaries of workers which are being withdrawn prematurely. Mm-hmm. So I think there wasn't enough tax education done on the financial implications to our people. And uh, they are being set up for massive failure for when they eventually retire. Yeah. And that's what we've been saying in the Standing Committee on Finance, that we need to have a look into how this thing is working because it's mm-hmm. not serving its envisioned yeah. purpose. Yeah. Because poor workers uh, who may have knowledge or no knowledge or little knowledge on the tax issues mm. now fall onto this trap of being told that they can access a portion of their savings or their pension fund from. Mm. But the problem is they are not going to enjoy the the benefits of their pension funds because now there is SARS that is going to take a portion or I think it's 10%. But when we look at the people who should be paying or should be taxed heavily. You look at Steinhoff, you look at the issues of tax evasion. Mm. Uh, Treasury has not been too effective when you look at holding to account yeah. to uh, evaders of, uh, you know, or those that evade uh, paying uh, tax. This must be a slap in the, uh, in the face of the poor. Absolutely. So SARS is uh, very lax on corporate fraud and ev- tax evasion and the movement, the profit shifting that we spoke about earlier, they, they are not as effective as they'd like to portray themselves to be on money laundering. I mean, Palapala happened under their nose, they, and they, they still uh, found no reason to sort of hold the president accountable for the tax-related crimes that were uh, related to that stuffing of that money in sofas. Mm-hmm. We don't know. SARS is not effective when it comes to those who are in power. But now they're going to generate massive amounts of revenue off the back of pension funds of people, mm. of the desperation of our people. And you know, the governor of the Reserve Bank was in the Standing Committee of Finance, I think last week or two weeks ago. And he was praising the two-part system as a method of increasing uh, economic growth and spending power of people. So I say to him, you know... <laughs> These people must just read. No. <laughs> They're embarrassing know, themselves. <laughs> I say to him, okay, so as the Reserve Bank, they established monetary policy where they set the interest rate. And the interest rate in South Africa is extremely high and it's to the benefit of the financial sector. So then they do a repo rate cut of 25 basis points, meaning uh, people will pay, uh, 25 uh, basis points, meaning people will pay less for car, home loans, and uh, all those sorts of things. So we say, firstly, that is an inadequate cut because our people uh, need at least a 50 basis point, 100 Mm -hmm. basis point reduction in the interest rates in order for them to continue to be able to survive and not live and earn salaries to repay debt for home loans and car loans. So if they say that the two-part system is a positive thing, it's almost like they're in a collusion with the the financial sector because they set high interest rates Mm -hmm. and then they support the revenue laws amendment below the two-part system where people will withdraw their money prematurely. 
And then those premature with, uh, withdrawals are going to go towards paying for those high interest rate loans which were established by the monetary policy of the Reserve Bank. So they set high interest rates and then they say to people you can withdraw portions of your pension in order to pay back the debt in which they've set high interest mm. rates in. So I say this is like a collusion, you're just exploiting our people. In the end, our people are working to pay debt uh, ultimately and the banks are going to profit from this. He said a lot of... Uh, unclear things, unclear explanations, but there's just bad policy making in the minds of South Africans and in terms of those who make policy, monetary policy in South Africa. Mm -hmm. And everything is centered around the financial sector generating profit. The two-part system, the banks are going to generate profit. The interest rates which are remaining extremely high, the banks are generating profit, all at the expense of people. So it's just bad monetary policy. And of course, the EFF has called for the nationalization of the Reserve Bank to get away from the private ownership in the Reserve Bank. There's private shareholdership where entities and individuals have shareholdership mm -hmm. in the institution that creates monetary policy in South Africa. People who are not in South Africa, people who are not South Africans, institutions that are not South African, dictate monetary policy mm -hmm. within the Reserve Bank. There's something interesting which uh, Dr. Gumani, our research and parliament, our senior mm -hmm. research and parliament says as well, that we must actually conduct an audit of the people who sit on the monetary policy committee. Because how do they continue to want to maintain high interest rates and we're not suspicious that these people are getting some sort of kickback somewhere? Because you maintain high interest rates so that banks can generate grotesque levels of interest, of uh, profits. So the fact that we don't look into the people who sit on the monetary policy committee, who generate this monetary policy which keeps our people in high levels of debt is something that is worrying. Because we must interrogate the people who set monetary policy where our debt is high we don't do lifestyle audits in them. We don't know who's influencing their decisions. We mm -hmm. even asked them uh, when they came to the standing committee on finance as well. What informs these policy positions that we've taken? Are you just copying the banks of England and Europe and the USA? Or is there an internal system that takes into consideration the unemployment in South Africa, the slow and stagnant economic growth mm -hmm. that is occurring in South Africa as well? But what we didn't ask, and I think that we should pursue as well, is the individuals, what types of lifestyles they're living, mm. those who are creating this monetary policy. Because to think that the Reserve Bank is immune to corruption would be extremely naive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I think uh, what allows that uh, corruption and this fraud is because uh, this white capital that is controlling uh, these state organs like the yeah. uh, South African Reserve Bank. So mm -hmm. if it is nationalized and the state gets to be the custodian yeah, of the yeah, Reserve yeah. Bank, I think it will be the beginning of uh, solving half of the problems that we have. Because if we don't control the means of production as, as, as the country, we are doomed. We are going to please the investors. The investors who at every turn will threaten to say, yeah. we are going to leave if uh, the EFF, political <laughs> yeah. you, you know what I mean which is a fallacy and I think uh, South Africans have been threatened for far too long yeah. that uh, should the EFF come into power uh, people will de-invest white people will relocate and all of that why, why do we allow white people to come and own our economy while we don't have yeah. any benefits from it so I think uh, the EFF is the uh, necessary tool in the hands uh, of the poor and people should be really persuaded um, under the ban of the Economic Freedom Fighters Commission. Yeah, definitely. Looking at the past uh, 11 years yeah. of um, the EFF, we have always said, do away with the tenders, abolish uh, the tenders. And had the state or had this policy been implemented, yeah. we, should, we wouldn't have seen the things we have seen or we are seeing now under the two-port uh, system. We have private companies who are not paying um, um, uh, the, 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 to the pay, uh, pension funds of the uh, employees. Mm -hmm. And we wouldn't be having private companies that are paying or paying the workers beyond, be, below the minimum wage. How do you think, how effective do you think the abolishment of tenders will uh, help or assist the black majority? Or should that policy be implemented? What are some of the benefits? Look, the benefit of uh, abolishing tenders is extremely important because, you know, South African municipalities and government waste a lot of money on tender contracts. Mm -hmm. 
instead of building internal capacity. Like the Auditor General mm. in uh, mm. South Africa, for example, every year releases a report on uh, expenditure on consultancy firms by municipalities mm -hmm. for basic things of uh, creating reports or financial reports and things of that nature. Millions, almost billions are spent every year on these firms because there's no internal capacity in municipalities. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you would hire a qualified chartered accountant or a qualified speech writer or a qualified something which is based on administrative services. Mm -hmm. You'd spend much less on salaries which would create jobs by building internal state capacity than you would on these tender contracts. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing. But also secondly, corruption in South Africa is largely tender related. Influence mm -hmm. over political decisions, over political leaders who take political decisions is always traced back to the tendering of a contract for services that ordinarily should be conducted by the state. So the state needs to generate its own internal capacity to conduct its affairs. And we said that in the manifesto ahead of the 2024 elections. State construction companies, state road companies, state-owned bank. If we can have all of these things being conducted internally through state capacity and uh, we industrialize through our own methods and own systems in place, a lot of corruption would be uprooted and a lot of money which is spent on tenders could be spent on service delivery purposes of building houses for our people, building schools, building clinics, and things of that nature. So a lot of wasteful expenditure uh, is rooted in the tender system, but also a lot of exploitation of workers is rooted in the tender system uh, through middlemen, through brokers who uh, exploit workers, make them work long hours, underpay them, and then we as a government or the state don't want to have responsibility because we don't we don't control we, we're not the ones who hired these people so it's another method and even when we used to fight this fight mm -hmm. in university for instance which we achieved in many institutions up vets mm -hmm. uct and many of them as well the the logic of uh, outsourcing is that the employer doesn't want to have responsibility over the livelihood mm -hmm. of the employee you don't want to be responsible for health benefits you don't want yeah. to be responsible for pension benefits and to avoid that, when they strike, you can just tell the company that they must fire those people because they're not directly employed by you. So it's a method of exploitation as well. And it's uh, unfortunate that the government of South Africa has utilized it. Um, in UCT, there was actually a report when they adopted the policy of uh, outsourcing. It was because workers were protesting too frequently. And uh, the process of firing them would take too long. There would be HR systems, whereas if you uh, outsource that service to a company, you simply tell that company that a certain employee is uh, becoming a problem and they remove them and fire them and you have no responsibility over mm -hmm. that process. Mm -hmm. So it's a way to undermine workers' rights. It's a way to exploit workers. And uh, so that's the two-pronged challenge that I think yeah. the abolishment of the tender system will fix in our society. Yeah, having exposed the loopholes that comes with the, the two-port system, what is your advice to uh, employees who are so keen uh, in withdrawing... Mm. Uh, from their pension funds through the two-port system. Would you say people should avoid um, the two-port system? Look, I think, and I, I understand, and the EFF said this, that as long as there's necessary education, financial education, then the two-port system is a necessary reform in terms of the pension fund sector. I mean, people die without accessing their pensions. So the logic for it is sincere, but... Uh, it's not achieving its envisioned purpose. Like a lot of people are going to leave themselves vulnerable for when they retire and for, for access to small amounts of money because so much of it is getting taxed, so much of it is falling through the cracks in withdrawal fees where financial sector is accumulating a lot of profit. So it's not achieving the necessary relief that it was supposed to do where if you have a serious challenge confronting you in the immediate, withdraw a portion of your pension to sort of try to alleviate that burden. But there's very little burden you can alleviate with the amount of money you get after it's taxed and has gone through the financial mm -hmm. sector system. You get so little that it becomes not worth it. And by the time you retire, you're going to be left with no means of sustaining yourself when you're unemployed. So mm -hmm. that's the danger that I think our people must take into consideration. We can't try to dictate to individuals who have uh, serious problems because of a dwindling economy and mismanagement of, mm -hmm. of uh, our lives by this government of the day. So... It is an individual decision to take it at an individual level, but I think our people must be careful mm -hmm. because it might not be worth it in the end. Yeah. yeah. Two advocates who were um, advocates uh, at the State Capture Commission of Inquiry are now 
consultants yeah, um, yeah. for the national prosecuting uh, authorities. Uh, what do you make of the appointment? I understand the EF, mm. uh, EFF has rejected the yeah. appointment of, uh, I think it's Advocate Matthews and, uh, Paul, yeah, yeah. and Paul uh, uh, Pretorius. Yeah. What do you make of uh, their appointment and whose interest do you think they will be serving these two chap? You know, when the EFF uh, said... Uh, that this is a is a collusion and a javelin approach because Charles Carlson and the mm -hmm. Pretorius were working for the Zondo Commission and they developed and led evidence in the Zondo Commission and now they are going to be part and parcel of the prosecutorial process at the NPA. They want access to uh, information and records held by the Justice Department indiscriminately through Advocate Shamila Batoi. When we raised our criticism of how this sheds doubt onto the neutrality of the justice system, a lot of people wanted to say the EFF is afraid, the EFF thinks now knows that Chaskalsen and Victoria are so competent, mm -hmm. they're going to be prosecuted. I'm like, prosecuted for what? Because mm -hmm. Chaskalsen and Victoria have been brought into the MPA for, on a consultancy basis, and we still don't know how much they're being paid, by the way, mm -hmm. in order to prosecute state capture-related cases. The EFF is the one that called for the establishment of that commission, by the way. A lot of people forget that. When, and it ended up being a gossip section and factionalized by Zondo and used to benefit a certain faction in the ANC, which is the unfortunate part. But we championed the establishment of the State of Capture Commission because it was the EFF that was at the forefront mm -hmm. of fighting for accountability of the capture of our state-owned enterprises, the corruption by then-President Zuma, and all of those things. So when people make those... Uh, very ill-informed comments that we're afraid. They are very misplaced. There's no one in the EFF who was implicated in state capture mm -hmm. or corrupting of state-owned enterprises. Mm -hmm. We have nothing to be afraid of, and we hold no brief for anyone who's implicated in the Zondo mm -hmm. Commission. They must be prosecuted if it's necessary to do so, and if they're guilty. We're just saying that the neutrality of the justice system must be maintained. Mm -hmm. The objectivity of the justice system must be maintained. So a person can't lead and develop evidence in one forum advise the NPA on what to do with the evidence they developed and then go and consult for the same NPA on the prosecutorial process of the evidence that they developed on another forum, which they advised what must be done with it. So they were advising themselves because they develop a case here, then they go and catch it on the other side to prosecute it. It's, a, it's just conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. And it's unfortunate that South Africans, just because the EFF is saying something, they don't want to take it seriously. It's a serious conflict of interest and it's going to leave loopholes where the NPA is going to be constantly put under review, where those who are guilty of these crimes are going to have a logical argument to say that there's collusion here and the corrupting of the process and the process is not fair. Let's just avoid casting doubt on the justice system of South Africa mm -hmm. and give competent people who are able to do that task and avoid giving criminals an excuse to say that they were wrongly persecuted. Yeah. yeah. Do you think President Cyril Ramaphosa is uh, above the law? We have seen now NPA has dropped uh, charges against him over the Palapala saga. They are no longer pursuing mm. the matter. What are, the, are are there politics at play here? I think the challenge in South Africa, which we raised in our manifesto, is the the president of South Africa has too much power to appoint people. Uh, who are supposed to even hold him accountable. He has the discretion to appoint the Chief Justice of the Constitutional Court, which he did uh, undermining the advisement of the JSC. Because mm -hmm. we said uh, that the Chief Justice Meyer should have been appointed a long time ago and not give Zondo a couple of months to, as a gratification for what he did in the Zondo Commission. Mm -hmm. But the President of South Africa has the unilateral ability to appoint a Chief Justice, Head of the NPA, mm -hmm. Public Protector, so all of these institutions that are supposed to hold him accountable, the people who are appointed there are beholden to him. Mm -hmm. So maybe let's not say he's above the law, but he's uh, got the ability to control the law in a very dangerous manner because those who head law enforcement agencies are appointed by him. And that's something that we need to change. The appointment of uh, the heads of Chapter 9 institutions, of Chief Justice, should be conducted in a much more democratic fashion and there shouldn't be unilateral. But that is dictatorship if anything. Mm. That is something that ought yeah. to be characterized as dictatorship. Mm -hmm. Because you can see now that institutions that were supposed to hold him accountable are being led by his political appointees. And those appointees are making dubious decisions. So we've taken the Pala Parliament to the Constitutional Court and uh, mm -hmm. let's watch and see. Because what the Parliament of South Africa did in the sixth administration, where, where they were threatening people that if they don't tow party line, they're going to be taken to D.C., was just a corrupted process where politicians voted on the innocence of an individual 
And you can't vote on corruption. Mm -hmm. They did it with ESCOM. We said there must be an inquiry into the corruption in ESCOM. They voted against that. That's the type of NC that we have. They want to vote against accountability, transparency, and uh, holding people accountable for corruption. Yeah. So uh, the challenge in the Constitutional Court is a very noble and important one because we must show that we don't subscribe to parliament sovereignty, where parliament must just take a decision and we must all run with it. That's the danger of it because now if there's no constitution to hold politicians accountable, politicians are going to use political power to undermine the rule mm. of law and to undermine the rights of individuals. And this is exactly what Ramaphosa is doing. That's yeah. exactly what he's doing. He's mm -hmm. priding himself. And the funny thing with Ramaphosa is that they had said that uh, they will take the the report of uh, Justice Sandil mm -hmm. on review. But after they won the vote in parliament, he abandoned that entire process. So you can see that they, they don't have a necessary interest in actually reviewing the report. It's, that report is unchallenged. Mm -hmm. But once they won it through a political voting process to shut down that report, he abandoned the legal challenge because his interest was to bury that report. Yeah. So the because it found out there's prima facie evidence yes, <laughs> yes. that must be investigated. So once the report was buried by Parliament, <laughs> yeah. Ramaphosa abandoned any attempt to review it because he knows that there's nothing you can review there. There's prima facie basis to impeach him, but uh, they won a political process through voting in Parliament. The constitution must uh, reverse that process, and that report must be tabled in the seventh administration. And we're going to push for him to be held accountable for Palapa. And we have seen uh, you on the ground, Commissar, pushing um, the the seventh administration uh, mm -hmm. to its limit. Uh, you have been on the ground as an EFF MP together with along other uh, alongside other MPs as well. What are some of the findings that you you had on the ground when you were conducting your oversight visit, and which areas did you did you go to, and uh, what are the developments there? No, so uh, during the oversight period, uh, I went to Tswane, where we did the oversight at uh, two abandoned buildings in Shupe Park and Kruger Park. And uh, those are massive, massive buildings with a lot of dilapidated infrastructure and mm -hmm. uh, could be turned into purposes of accommodation for low-cost housing or student housing. And they've been abandoned for 10 to 15 years, respectively. So uh, we've written to the IFP Minister of Cogta, who uh, we've noted to just be missing in action because uh, we don't know what he's doing. So we forget sometimes that you have yeah, ministers. Minister. Yeah, Shabis. Shabis. I mean, Kheng was the Deputy Minister of Transport. We, yeah. These people are just operating under the radar. They're not doing anything. So we've written to him as to what are, how can we possibly, as a person who's a custodian of municipalities, repurpose those buildings for accommodation purposes for students or for low-cost housing as well. But also we went to the Department of Labor where we were interrogating the pension system that we've been raising in Parliament. And we found there that uh, the Department of Labor, like many departments in South Africa, they don't own the properties they operate in. So in Mamelodi, the landlord can just, we don't have a Department of Labor that is operational, a center, because the landlord just decided to cancel the lease. Now the people of Mamelodi don't have services in terms of labor provisions. The UIF online system was offline for almost two months. People couldn't make their withdrawals. So we raised that in Parliament and we're going to continue interrogating those institutions. But something that the EFF must continue to champion and fight against is this thing of uh, state institutions renting property. It is extremely immature that the government doesn't own the properties it operates in and is paying exorbitant rates in uh, rentals to landlords mm -hmm. uh, who have evergreen contracts uh, with departments of the state. Mm -hmm. And it's something we must fight against. Mm -hmm. And if we scrutinize who stands to benefit, it's yeah. white monopoly capitalism, yeah, the yeah. financial sector at yeah, the end yeah. of the day. Everything goes back to the financial sector. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, I think we need to break that second, and the EFF is there to safeguard as the vanguard of uh, the people. As we wind up, Commissar, uh, I just want you to take this opportunity to allay some fears mm. amongst the fighters, uh, the people who believe in the EFF. There were claims that the EFF is going to die because people have left. The departure of Floyd, we have seen with Cope, with Cope started like this, blah, 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 blah. Do you think the EFF is going to die? And... Some of us know the EFF as a solid uh, socialist uh, economic emancipation movement deeply rooted in ideology. But how do you respond to those that say 
the departure of some prominent uh, individuals in the EFF is likely to lead the party to dwindle into insignificance or it will reduce the support that the party has? How do you allay or how do you respond to such um, conversations? It's not the first time, you know, that people predict the death of the EFF. And I'm not sure if they are not tired of being disappointed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because the EFF is not going to die. And mm -hmm. it's not an organization of individuals. And I think it's been proven in these past few months where there's some attempt to make staggered departures. You know, that's the analysis that we should make is that there are individuals who are just staggering living. So in order for it to make news, it won't be newsworthy or sustainable if they all live at once. So one mm -hmm. will leave this week, another will leave in two weeks, another will leave next month because they want to portray an image that there's a mass exodus, that people are here, they, then, then they're deciding enough is enough. But the, there's a, a grouping that has perhaps, I think, decided to leave the EFF a long time ago mm -hmm. and it's now being staggered. And the sentiments that were shared in the, the reading of the constitution of the Mkondo Isizwe party reaffirmed this thinking to me that there's a staggered leaving approach mm. because they say people must wait until 2026. They must stay put where they are because uh, they operate with politics of deceit. So it made me realize that these uh, departures are not occurring as a mistake uh, in different occasions. There's a, you'll find that there's a roadmap where you, you'll resign on this day you will resign on this day, you'll resign on that day. Mm. So we mustn't be scared by that. There's people who have decided to leave a long time ago and they are staggering that process. And uh, the present commander in chief advised us that uh, people will follow him. Uh, I don't think it has hurt the EFF. In fact, qualitatively, the outputs of the EFF have improved drastically because I think everyone has risen to the occasion that we have to defend our movement. So in councils, in legislatures, in parliament, Deployees are working at their hardest. CCT members, members of the provincial command teams and regions are on the ground preparing branches to go to the National People's Assembly. You can see there's a level of enthusiasm and determination in the EFF that is based on the fact that we have to close ranks, defend ourselves and advance the struggle for economic freedom in our lifetime. So it can't die because ideas don't die. And the EFF is an idea mm -hmm. whose time has come. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Steve Biko once said, uh, I'd rather die for an idea yeah, yeah. that will live on. Yeah. So the EFF is beyond um, individuals Absolutely. because this is a socialist ideology that will live beyond uh, individuals. Uh, your vision for the economic uh, freedom fighters and what motivates you to remain or to always choose the EFF as your political home? EFF has an undying love for the people of this country, for the people of this continent. And uh, it's extremely inspiring in terms of it's got coherent ideas for anything that you think needs to be fixed in South Africa. The Economic Freedom Fighters is the most coherent response to the oppression of our people, to the historical uh, exploitation of our people, to the historical structural challenges, of racism, landlessness, service delivery and corruption. The EFF has an answer to all of that. So it's extremely difficult to leave the EFF and say you're joining an alternative because there's no alternative that has coherently organized its thinking, its ideas, and its structures mm -hmm. as much as the EFF. The EFF is ready to be the place to unite black people. We're not preparing it. We're not saying join us and then we're developing something on the way. We've yeah. developed everything that is necessary to lead South African society, internal systems, policy perspectives, a proven 11-year track record of holding the executive accountable and uh, championing the issues of society. Mm -hmm. So we're the ready movement to unite all black people yeah. towards liberation. Yeah. We're not an experiment. <laughs> we're, we're tried and tested. So yeah. uh, experiments must uh, try be tried and tested before they call themselves a place to unite around. The mm -hmm. EFF is where black people should unite in South Africa mm -hmm. under the leadership of Julius Mali. Absolutely. And yeah. guided by the theoretical thinking of uh, uh, Franz Fanon, we, yeah, yeah. ours is a generational mission which we have chosen to defend. And now we're going to rebuild and advance yeah. the struggle for uh, economic freedom in our lifetime. Definitely. Talk to us about the voter registration weekend in yeah. Tabazimbi. I saw um, the battalion on the ground. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Public representatives of the EFF, members of the Central Command team, but in Tabazimbi this past week, so the municipality was dissolved. 
uh, because of mismanagement, it was a DA-led municipality. Uh, and uh, of course, there's been a lot of, par- there was parallel government, basically, there, where there was two municipal managers, two mayors, and just a mess occurring in terms of service delivery to our people. So the National Council of Provinces, the NCOP, resolved that it must be dissolved. And uh, the by-elections for the wards there will be happening on the 4th of December this year. So it was voter mm-hmm. registration this weekend. We were all on the ground interacting with communities, getting our people to register to vote. Mm-hmm. And uh, that work will continue and hopefully will register a decisive victory in December. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, as as we gravitate towards that victory, yeah. uh, song of the day, Commissar? Hey, you know, uh, TKZ. TKZ, we love this place. Mm-hmm. I think it's appropriate. It's an appropriate song uh, yeah. for the current moment that we're going in politically. Mm-hmm. We're in a place where we're, we're in love with the ideas, we're in love with what we stand for, and we're not going anywhere anytime soon. So mm-hmm. I think TKZ, we love this place. It's a, it's a good song for yeah. where we are right now. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> no, thank you very much, Komisa, for making time and uh, sharing your wisdom with us and giving us the confidence that... Uh, the EFF is not going anywhere. Yeah, yeah. It remains uh, the only vehicle towards economic uh, freedom in our lifetime. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, to the people of South Africa as well, for the people of South Africa, Africa, and the world, because we're not only an organization for South <laughs> Africa. <laughs> Next time we'll touch on the issue of immigration. I'm very tired. You know, I spent, <laughs> I spent many years talking about uh, immigration. immigration. I get very tired. At all. But of course, we need Yeah, to... because we get misconstrued. Yeah, loosely. yeah. <laughs> but we, get, we, we, we have a responsibility to elevate the thinking and the uh, orientation of our people and understanding of the question. But uh, hopefully you'll talk to someone else about that. I'm a spent force <laughs> <laughs> on explaining the immigration yeah. question. Yeah, thank you very much, the people of South Africa, Africa and the world for tuning in to this week's episode uh, for the EFF podcast. Thank you very much for always subscribing and uh, tuning in. We've come to the end of the show. My name is Titus Tsungu. I'm Tsungu. Until we meet again, good day. Go and get